Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Experts Roundtable, Balkans at the Juncture, Regional Collaboration or Fragmentation. As we probably heard or read, the main topic of this uh, forum is mapping the future, uncertainties, realities and opportunities in the wake of geopolitical changes that we are facing at the moment. Well, since Russia's attack on Ukraine, nowhere the uncertainty has been more felt than in the Balkans. As yesterday, Albanian Prime Minister said during his speech uh, in the room right next door, the Balkans has been specifically prone to the uh, different influences in these times, challenging times, and faces more challenges than maybe any other region at this moment in Europe. In the Balkans, as many of you probably know or don't know, we still have countries where more than 60-70% of the people strongly support Vladimir Putin and see Russia as a partner. And at the same time, those countries are committed to the EU and NATO and remain fo focused and see these institutions as a reliable partners for the future of the region. NATO chief several times already said that the next possible hotspot in Europe after Ukraine could be the Balkans, especially Bosnia and Herzegovina and Kosovo. Today I have an outstanding panel to discuss the current situation uh, in the Balkans, the possible scenarios that we are facing and the possible solutions that we could suge uh, suggest or, or messages to send from this, uh, from this room today. Let me introduce my speakers first. I do sound very serious, but speaking about the Western Balkans in a time of yet another war in Europe is very serious. And thank you all for being here with us and listening to this significant topic. My speakers, our host in some way, His Excellency Ambassador Faru Kaimakje, Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs and Director of EU Affairs of Republic of Turkey. Her Excellency Ms. Jovana Marovic, former Deputy Minister and Minister of European Affairs, former Deputy Prime Minister of uh, European Affairs of Montenegro. Mr. Miroslav Lajčak, EU Special Representative for the Belgrade-Pristina Dialogue and other Western Balkan regional issues, and Dr. Mylinda Bregu, Secretary General of Regional Cooperation Council. Ambassador Kaimakci, let me start with you. How do you assess the current situation in the Balkans where you spend a lot of your time? We know that Ankara is always aligned with the EU and NATO, when it comes to the Balkans and its approaches to specifically Kosovo and Bosnia. Um, thank you very much. Um, also, I would like to start by welcoming our friends uh, from the rest of the Balkans, or if I can say from the south east of Europe. And uh, good to see you here in Istanbul at the uh, here at the uh, World Forum. Um, as you mentioned, you know, especially after the Russian war, Against, against Ukraine, uh, the, tragedy, I mean, the fragilities in the Balkans became more, I think, uh, visible and more important. Uh, but also, as you mentioned, uh, I think by now, uh, from the EU side, it is now better understood that Tur Turkey's uh, policies in the Balkans are very much matching uh, with, the, with the policy of the EU. But unfortunately, uh, years ago, uh, some of uh, our colleagues in Brussels uh, portrayed Turkey as a threat in the Balkans as a, as a destabilizing uh, actor. Uh, you know, uh, I mean, and also uh, uh, competing with the EU. Actually, our policy is very simple. Uh, Turkey itself is a Balkan state, and this is why we do not like very much this uh, terminology of Western Balkans because there is no Eastern Balkans, Southern Balkans. We are all Balkans at the end, and we want to see all the Balkan states uh, joining, uh, if they wish, of course, to the extent that they wish, uh, both the EU and NATO, and we are, we are supporting this. And we have good connections. Uh, we are trying to do our best uh, when it comes to sensitivities in, 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 uh, in Bosnia-Herzegovina, for example, 
we believe that we can talk to all sides uh, and uh, it is important to get calls not only from uh, one side of the administration but from different uh, sides of the administration and we have established um, you know trilateral bilateral mechanisms uh, in order to fill the gap and in order to restore confidence but also in order to give uh, a, a joint common future altogether you know in the trans uh, in the I mean I would say euro-atlantic uh, family and uh, this is this is our policy and uh, I think today we see much better cooperation with the EU and much better understanding that we are working together against any force of uh, destabilization in the Balkans, uh, any, against any, any force of separation in the Balkans, and I think our, our policy uh, are matching. And I hope that we can cooperate more with the EU also in line with our accession perspective because we don't want to be seen only as a partner of the EU in the Balkans, but uh, as a part of the EU in the Balkans. I think this would, this would bring much more, uh, you know, f uh, I mean, deliverable results uh, for the Balkans. Uh, we have here the EU representative uh, with us. Uh, as Ambassador Kaimakci said, Turkey was perceived at one point in the Balkans by the EU officials as a destabilizing factor. How is that being perceived now, Turkey's neutrality in the conflict uh, in Ukraine as well? Uh, is the EU st uh, still seeing Turkey as a destabilizing factor in the Balkans? I would say that the EU has never seen Turkey as a destabilizing factor. There were some individuals who were saying so, those who did not really have the clear picture of the situation. For those who are following the situation on the ground, it was very clear, exactly as uh, Minister Kaimachi said, we share the same vision for the Balkans, we share, we, we share the same goals, and we are partners. We are uh, working in, towards the same goal and in the same direction. Uh, Turkey has proven also in these difficult times of, uh, of Russia's aggression against Ukraine uh, how important role uh, it can play, and it plays, and we are grateful for that. And speaking about the, the region, I, I, again, I agree with Ms. Kaimachi. There was a period of many years of uh, complacency and uh, lack of honesty between the European Union and the Balkans when we were, uh, or we, the EU representatives, were telling the, the, the Balkan leaders that uh, we see them as our future members, but this is, was not ex necessarily what they were thinking. And the Balkan leaders were telling us that uh, for them the European integration is the priority and uh, the accompanying reforms are the matter of priority. And this was, again, not what they were really thinking and doing. Uh, but this uh, war, uh, Russia's war against Ukraine, has come as a wake-up call. And uh, there is no more room for complacency. There, there, is, there is no more room for uh, games being played. This is a moment of truth. And the moment of truth uh, shows us clearly that the Balkans will not be safe until and unless they join the European Union. There is this understanding on the side of the European Union. All of a sudden, our leaders are saying that the future is, in, uh, is the membership, which was not the case five years ago. We are having uh, at least one summit a year. Now, this year, two summits, the first time in the region. We are sending all, all the positive signals, but this is not enough. I mean, to turn this momentum into a new quality, we need uh, a new approach both from the European Union and from the Balkans because unfortunately the sad truth is that the region is less prepared for integrating in the European Union today than it was uh, five Mr. years Lechik, ago. Lechik, we are talking about, and please, uh, all the speakers, if you want to join the conversation anytime, you don't need to wait for me to uh, ask the specific question. Mr. Lechik, we are talking, I mean, most of us here, about this new EU approach for a long time, and you are saying that this moment is the wake-up call. So what is the new approach? We've seen the, the, the Western Balkan Summit in Tirana, but Roaming uh, is a good idea, university um, is a good idea, but no concrete steps uh, as of yet. The, the new momentum did not come with the war. The new momentum came earlier, uh, I would say uh, 2021, uh, because the lowest point in our relationship, uh, at least the way I see it, was uh, uh, the, the French veto, uh, unexpected veto against Albania and North Macedonia in 2019, 
which came as a s negative surprise to, to many. And then uh, uh, COVID, when the European Union was unable to protect the, the region. We took care of ourselves, our own citizens, but uh, forgot about the Balkans and the reaction in the region was very negative. And there were voices saying, we need to take care of ourselves because European Union is not willing to do so. So this changed the understanding. So the new approach is already approach of 2021. And the war in Ukraine only like stressed even more that. Uh, so the momentum is there, but uh, uh, as you said, so far the momentum has been uh, like expressed through lots of goodwill, statements, visits, uh, summits, promises, but we, st we still don't have the clear strategy how to turn this new momentum and new goodwill into a new quality. Uh, but again, as I said, uh, it, it takes two to tango. And, you know, when the European Union granted the candidate status to Ukraine, Moldova, and condition to Georgia, wanted to show that we did not forget about the Balkans, but we could not identify a single country in the Balkans that could serve as a good example. And we are still struggling. So th this, is, this is the problem. So we really need our partners to use this momentum and to do their part. Uh, Ms. Marovic, uh, let me come to you now. Your country, uh, Montenegro, is also facing another political crisis exacerbated with the situation in Ukraine as well. Um, the EU officials often say uh, for the Balkans, we see you as part of the EU. Uh, what's the sentiment in Montenegro? Where is Montenegro heading towards Russia? or towards the EU, because this is the country traditionally also as well, very divided, and we see that on political, political scene at the moment. Well, I don't know where Montenegro is going at the moment. As you said, there is the political crisis, and it's not about uh, pro-Russian or uh, pro-Montenegro, pro-Europeans, pro -Europe, pro because all the political parties are on the paper for the European Union. There is 76% of people which are for the European Union, so there is clear pro-European orientation, but if this uh, political crisis, uh, if it, it is uh, and if it will continue for some time, I'm afraid that after the elections or after some time, the pro-Russian uh, pro forces could take advantage of the situation. And that's mainly because of the relations between the EU and the Western Balkans, because there is still business as usual. And as you said, there are some steps, there are some positive uh, signs from the European Union, but we don't see clear vision for the Western Balkans. Saying that, I have to say that the new methodology is still on hold, that we are still waiting for the instruments from the new methodology, that the uh, lowering the prices, decreasing the prices for oil roaming and many other initiatives, that's good, but we still wait concrete instruments for strengthening the rule of law, because this is the main problem in the Western Balkans. And of course, the, the, main, uh, um, the main responsibility for such situation is on political elites in the Western Balkans, because we are still putting the identity issues and the nationalism before the reforms. And that's the main things. And let's use Montenegro as an example. This is the most advanced country in the European integration process, meaning that we uh, achieved and fulfilled technical criteria in all the negotiating chapters, in all the area of Haki. But when it comes to the rule of law, when it comes to really concrete results, we are missing to, to deliver for five years now. So change of the government and change of the autocratic leaders hasn't changed anything in the country. That's the first thing. Because the political elites are still using non-democratic practices. They are fine with you know, non-democratic practices, but they are not improving procedures. They are not using concrete, concrete examples and good examples from the, from the European Union. That's the first thing. The second thing is this uh, approach from the European Union level with many ups and downs. The EU is always good with the defining strategy, defining framework, but not in delivering and, and uh, being mentored to uh, uh, importing democracy to the Western Balkans. So using the example of Montenegro, democracy is almost the same as it was 10 years ago when we started the, the negotiating process. So there is a fault from our side, but there is also a fault from the EU, EU side, for sure. Whether the EU is still able to import the democracy to the Western Balkans, but also to Ukraine, to Moldova, to all other countries which, are, which want to join the European Union. Then, as you said, there is a war in Ukraine. It is a wake-up call for 
for uh, the European Union, but we don't see any concrete results and any concrete change in the approach. You know, there is support, of course, it's good to have the funds for the mitigating the risks and, and uh, an energy crisis, but we still need support on the ground when it comes to, to rule of law and democracy. And let's use this example of sanctions towards Russia, against Russia. As you can see, the, not all Western Balkan countries are using the same approach. Not all the Western Balkans are aligned with the EU common foreign and security policy. And what is the response from the European Union? It's just about assessment in the country report. So Montenegro is doing great because we introduced eight packages uh, sanctions towards Russia and uh, 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 Serbia is recording backsliding when it comes to EU common foreign and security policy. And Serbia is for sure the stabilizing factor in the Western Balkans. So it's really important to have these incentives and sanctions from the new methodology for the countries which want to join the European Union. Just to go back uh, uh, for uh, about the political situation in the country, in Montenegro, I think that the most important thing now for the European Union to be kind of mediator in Montenegro in order to elect pro-European government and not to go with, you know, pro-Russian, pro-Serbian forces in the country because there is chance to have this uh, um, let's say, to, to these forces to take advantage of the political crisis in the country and also... What would that mean for Montenegro, if that happens? Uh, uh, Montenegro is clearly uh, following the EU common foreign and security policy, and there is clear pro-European orientation. And as you said, there is tra uh, traditional division between um, this uh, friendship with Russia and the West, but uh, a friendship is with uh, Russian people, and not with autocrats in Russia, that's for sure. That's the, the first thing. And the second thing, uh, Montenegro is aligned with uh, EU common foreign and security policy from the very beginning, from, from 2040, when there was uh, an action of Crimea, and when, well, they, they were, they, when there were the coup attempt in Montenegro in 2016, so we introduced many times sanctions towards Russia, no matter consequences. So we are clearly on the European path. But, you know, this fear okay. to go in a different direction is really something which could destabilize the complete region. Uh, Ms. Bregu, uh, I don't want this panel to be just on the negativities. Can you find some positive steps that happened in this fragmented region in a time of crisis? So this audience, at least for once, hears that we are moving somewhere in some direction better. Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, I think I'm the wrongest person on earth <laughs> to speak uh, sweeteries. Uh, I'm not a sweet tooth at all, so it's going to be pretty hard for me. I know. Mm -hmm. like uh, uh, to try to change uh, this uh, opening of, uh, of the panel. What has been said like so far, it's true. But in the Western uh, Balkans, one thing should remain, I think, ironclad, and that is the idea that the Western Balkans and you should stay closer together. There is uh, nothing that makes the Western Balkans like a safer or better region if the EU will be like moving apart or at least stall the process of membership and enlargement as it happened last year. The Western Balkans are better within the tent, the EU tent, than outside the tent, being wet and then shelter can be offered by others. Uh, there is something else that stands true. In the Western Balkans, an ounce of prevention always is worth or weighs more than a pound of cure. Uh, and I think that that is one of the messages uh, that shed light to the European Union and to the decision makers. When I speak of European Union, I'm not referring to Brussels only. Brussels is not only taking decisions, our member states taking decisions as well. So that is what shed the light in there, that the biggest problems for the European Union in the foreign policy is to leave the Western Balkans outside, not attended. As Yovana started to say, the process of European integration of our countries was based on the promise that on the way we'll be monitoring you, offering a hand to help you in building your societies from the former Yugoslavia, like a despotic glue that was present in there, apart from Albania, but Albania had the communist regime, one of the most severe in the world, 
And then the promise was, we'll help you to make your countries more democratic, safer and sure. But on the way, with like the process of enlargement being like taken uh, and, and being expanded more than like, like 30 or four years, then the good incentives for politicians in the region started to evade. And when the good incentives evade, then the disincentives cannot be bad enough even for those who don't apply the rules. And that's what happened with the process. Now, since you asked me on something good, uh, yes, please, because I think these people here are no, very No, this worried. is not all gloomy. It's not <laughs> exactly. all gloomy in the region. And I have to say, uh, even the fact that the region is like, uh, it lives in peace and we're the citizens of it, more than like 83% with the last poll that we had after the war in Ukraine, believe that they need to live and cooperate stronger together, that the regional cooperation is good for them. So a region when this new consciousness, and speaking it's like a region that came out of the war, not like, like one century uh, ago. So this is, uh, almost, this is uh, present everywhere in the region, overwhelmingly. Uh, then how I see, and I, I think that I'm one of the persons that lived in the process or lived through the mantra of European enlargement and integration at least from 2005, now it's like 17 years. So uh, I, I think that I'm one of the, of the few who started and know this process from the days of the first promise and then until today. Uh, I'm afraid that we should like a bit spin and change our minds. The region and the Western Balkans will not become safer and better waiting for the date in the calendar of the membership. We will become better if we decide to apply those European standards that make our citizens vote by their feet, leaving their countries, uh, in the ground, in the Western Balkans. Said that every like rapprochement or any like facing in EU calls it, every, every policy that brings the Western Balkans closer to the EU or that brings the standards that the EU citizens have in their own countries to the EU is welcome. We know that the, uh, there is like, the process has changed a lot. In Brussels, if you'll mention enlargement, even in other EU member states, politicians will never dare to say that word prior to their national elections and local elections. And if a theme or a topic doesn't give votes to you, then you are not going like, uh, uh, like to pitch for that. This is quite, quite common everywhere. So now that we are under these circumstances, what would make the region better? More economic integration among countries. Considering and coming together because Western Balkans all in all is only 1% of the GDP of the EU. Our markets are quite small. Divided, we can't conquer. If we need more foreign direct investments, we'll need to be a bigger market. A bigger market, we can be all six together. That's why the process started to create like the same model of the EU single market, the common regional market in the region. Policies that I mentioned that are happening anywhere. The roaming that was mentioned in here. Yes, uh, I know that the utmost is membership, but on the way to membership, shall we just stay there and at least not focus all our efforts to make everything possible. That's why whatever there is a chance to recognize, as we did the diplomas in the region, is a good chance. 8,000 youngsters last year applied for the recognition of their diplomas. Out of 8,000, I hope not all 8,000 would love to leave the Balkans and go and find a job in Germany or, or, or Paris or, or, I don't know, somewhere else in Europe. At least 2,000 of, of them can stay in the region. Recognition of professions is a good thing. If we'll be like a facing crisis one after another, like it happened during the pandemic, doctors from now on have a chance to work somewhere else in the region. Then like, like the roaming one, like the green agenda, the, like all the threads that we share together, all the, all the disinformation threads that we share together. So trying to bring the region closer, if not the up down approach is not working greatly, then let's even like to push the bottom line. Uh, Ambassador Kaimakchi, uh, Ms. Bregu just mentioned the economy, uh, having one market, uh, especially now in, uh, when we are facing one of the toughest winters and we don't know what's going to happen. And this is something that Ankara often says, they do want to uh, work closely economically with the Balkan countries. Ankara also supports the Open Balkan Initiative. Could this be 
the first step towards better future to all those young people that are leaving the country, the, the region every day? Um, I think yes, this is uh, one of the important, you know, thinking in the Balkans. Yes, the accession process should be there, but meanwhile I think we need to focus on development and on economy and also, um, you know, in terms of employment we need to focus uh, also in education. One of the main problems of the Balkans is the brain drain. Actually, the, you know, the young people of, of the Balkan states are leaving uh, for better conditions in the rest of Europe. And this is really uh, complicated. And this is why our priority is the economy in the Balkans. Uh, when we take you know, 11 uh, South Eastern European countries, uh, we can say that we, re we have reached $20 billion of uh, trade volume. And we have more or less $24 billion of uh, direct investment uh, in these countries. For example, I was in Albania yesterday. Uh, I am proud to say that we have 600 companies uh, operating in Albania with a um, volume of $3.5 billion of uh, investment in this country, which makes Turkey the biggest direct investor uh, in Albania. So I think we need to really focus on, 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 on the economy, uh, on employment, but also on education. Of course, the enlargement uh, party, I just wanted to say a few words because, uh, yes, I mean, it is important, but uh, let's remember why we are too late in terms of the enlargement process. Why we do not have enough motivation in the candidate countries to make drastic reforms. Let's question this. I think one of the main reasons is that the nationalization of EU's enlargement policy. Where is the commission that we used to see in uh, 2000, for example? The European Commission was talking about, you know, general interest of Europe and uh, geopolitical EU even at that time. And I think it was important, this is why the candidate countries made tremendous efforts, a lot of reforms, to become part of the EU. But today, the nationalization of the enlargement policy, you know, not Europeanization, but in, you know, nationalization by a few member states, I think complicated the problem a lot. And in the Balkans, I mean, in Southeast Europe, we are all interconnected. If you don't solve the problem with Serbia, you know, uh, and Kosovo, you have uh, implications for Montenegro. If you don't do what is necessary, then you have a complication in Sarajevo. You know, so it is so much interlinked, and I think we should create a positive momentum, and this is actually what the future of Europe uh, conference proposes, and also this is actually what is also proposed by the uh, recent report by the European Parliament, that the unanimity should not be abused in the accession negotiations. Why we should wait for unanimity to open a technical chapter, let's say, on transport? Let's open that chapter. Let's close that chapter. This means it will create employment in the transport sector in that specific candidate country. But why we are blocking this? Uh, because one of the member states is not satisfied. If we talk about the membership of that country, this is a big issue, I understand, this is also political, but this, this can be done at the end. Let's open and close the chapters by, let's say, qualified majority voting. This will accelerate the accession process. It will improve the conditions in the candidate countries, and it will give uh, a better perspective to the candidate countries, but also it will help in terms of relations between candidate countries and the member states. I think this is what we need. But as long as, you know, the, the abuse of the veto right continues, as long as blind membership solidarity is there to be abused against the candidate country in the negotiations, I am afraid we will not make any progress in any case of a candidate country. So uh, this, is, uh, this is where we need Europeanization. And I think uh, economy, 
economic dimension of this process is important, it helps. Because if you remember when we made a lot of reforms from 99 to 2006, uh, Turkish government and the Turkish people, you know, they were convinced of the process because it has delivered. It has tripled Turkey's GDP from $3,500 to around $11,000. Uh, $11, so this has created deliverables, and I think uh, this aspect has been neglected by the EU side because of, you know, uh, some... I would say, intransigent positions of some of the member states, which are not helpful uh, to the general interest of the EU. Mr. Either. Lychak, how is um, this, what Ambassador Kaimakchi just mentioned, uh, not having all the EU states at the same page when it comes to several issues um, uh, in the region, making your job more difficult? I was in Pristina recently, and I asked a couple of young people, what do they think about the EU? Will they help? Uh, them solve the conflict, uh, the tensions, put down the tensions in North. What they told me is, what can we expect from the EU? They still have members who don't even recognize us, like Greece, like Slovakia, like Spain. I'm not going to go into the details of the recognition or not, but is this where all the problems lie, even if the countries make some reforms like North Macedonia and Albania, um, that still there are members who don't want to change their policies towards other countries. And we've seen what happened in Moldova, Georgia, and Ukraine. That happened quite quickly, which even more provoked and frustrated all of us here in the region. And we have here Albanian, a Turkish person, Montenegrin, Bosnian. This is something that where we all agree on. Okay, let me be honest and realistic uh, in answering your question. First of all, I agree with uh, Mr. Kaimakchi that the issue of unanimity, an issue of politicization of opening chapters, and also the issue of nationalization of enlargement are the real problems. They exist and they need to be addressed, and we are trying to address them. Uh, but to make a step back, uh, one has to see that uh, the relationship between the European Union and, and the Western Balkans is not the only relationship that the European Union has, and it is affected by the, the global situation. And the fact is that in the last um, several years, last 10 years or so, European Union had to deal with uh, many big problems which were not planned, not expected, but became number one priority. And it's starting with the financial crisis 2009 and 10, but then announcement of Brexit, uh, you had a migration crisis, you had Donald Trump changing the, the global paradigms, you had Russia's annexation of Crimea, uh, and then you had COVID. So all these were the issues that uh, clearly made themselves priority issues, and therefore the issue of enlargement was pushed down the list of priorities. That's objective. You cannot complain. This is, this is what it is. And second, as I said, right now we have uh, goodwill, we have the understanding that uh, there is an unfinished business. Uh, we are struggling, to, but working, uh, to find a way how to turn this uh, goodwill into a new quality. But it would be a big mistake if the region believes that all they can do is to sit, wait, comment, and criticize. I mean, let me be blunt. I mean, the European Union doesn't want more problems. And therefore, European Union needs to be convinced that uh, with the accession of new members, we will have less problems and more solutions. We will be stronger, we will be more united, we will be more able to uh, deliver decisions and to be a global player. I think it's very legitimate. So therefore, uh, the answer is exactly as Mylinda said, more regional cooperation, improve the atmosphere among the six. This is in your hands. This is in your, you don't need European Union for that. Uh, uh, see yourself in the global context. Uh, you see yourself that the, the importance of the Balkan problems was of one size before the Russia's war against Ukraine. It's a different uh, after the war. So when we are busy with, 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 uh, with mitigating the impact of, of the war, we would wish the Balkans to be part of our solution, not only joining our statements, but also being able to communicate among themselves normally uh, uh, and, and, and show that they, they can deal with their own issues. Because sometimes, uh, I mean, I'm a strong supporter of enlargement, and, and people know that, but sometimes I believe that it's easy for the, for the region to criticize the European Union rather, that, rather than to start from themselves. And there is so much they can do. 
without the European Union. And then it will certainly change the atmosphere in the European Union, including uh, the view some EU member states are seeing some problems, or, 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 co or for example, the issue of Kosovo that you mentioned. Yeah, give, give them good reason to change their, their opinion, uh, and, and they will. But uh, it's, it's, again, it will not happen by itself. So therefore, I say it takes two to tango, and uh, before criticizing the EU, let's first present a list of good things that the region has produced, and come to Brussels and say, look, this is what we are, and we are make it, going to make you but stronger. But we've seen North uh, Macedonia and Albania doing exactly that. It's hard to argue with you. I'm very sorry for what happened to North Macedonia and Albania. It's not just me. Uh, please, other panelists, I, uh, join the yeah, discussion. I, and that's the issue of national. That's the issue of nationalization of, uh, of the of the enlargement policy, uh, which is uh, uh, unfortunate and regrettable. And let's uh, hope that uh, we have all learned uh, our lesson from that, because uh, obviously uh, the, the the credibility of the whole process suffers. And once again, to blame each other will not help. Uh, we are in a new geopolitical situation, and this new geopolitical situation is globally tragic, but when it comes to the Western Balkans, it's positive, because it created new momentum. There is a, a, a new attention, new commitment, new goodwill, and it, if we miss this opportunity, if we miss this momentum, if we let, if we let it pass, we can only ourselves bl to blame. Uh, Ms. Marovic, do you see this as a good opportunity for the Western Balkans? Well, I don't see it as a good opportunity, even though I, I, I'm not the one to, 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 to blame and not the one who is sitting and criticizing just the European Union and expecting the European Union to integrate us the way we are at the moment because we are so far from the European Union and so far from the level of preparedness to be ready for, for the European Union, so for sure. But as I was criticizing my own government while I was sitting in it, so I'm pretty much aware what is the situation and how far we are for, from the reforms and from the level of the rule of law which is desired to enter the European Union. But the European Union once integrated the country, integrated the, the countries which were not ready for the, Euro, for the membership, and that was really and pretty much good for them, you know, like being part of the club, being isolated uh, of uh, and not being uh, um, under the influence of the third parties and also receiving more funds that that was pretty much good for their reforms and also being there in the government i'm pretty much aware that we are not ready to change and that's true that's something uh, which i already explained just changing the government and changing the the corrupt is, political is elites. the ethnocentrism and populism the problem. The, that's something that we usually have in the internal politics. So let's look a little bit inside our governments. Is this the problem? The problem is that we never experienced democracy as such. So we are still learning democracy and we are still, still learning and trying to improve procedures and, and, and uh, um, processes in the countries. And the thing is that it's much easier to go with, you know, like interests and to go with these non-democratic practices. If you have clear interests, you will take the easier way, you know. That, that's how political elites in the Balkans cooperate, cooperate and that, that's how they act. And at the same way, what, uh, for example, um, officials in Montenegro are trying to suggest it, that, that it's better for the European Union and for Montenegro and for the Western Balkans to integrate us just the way we are at the moment. And that's not good, of course, and that's not something which will be helpful for the rule of law and for democracy in our countries, but that's also one, one part of the solution, let's say in that way, because, as I said, there is no clear vision from the European Union how to improve democracy even in the EU member states, and also in the, uh, at the supranational level, at the level of the European Union, and also in the Western Balkans. In my opinion, uh, the, the strengthening of democracy should go hand in hand. Let's use the Western Balkans as a case study, let's um, use some instruments and test, test it at the West, in the Western Balkans. So that's, that's my opinion. That's how the EU should prove once again that it has transformative power. And as you mentioned, the Open Balkans, Balkans as the initiative, which is one of the um, controversies at the moment in the Western Balkans, but also in the European Union. And that's also one of the topics and one of the areas where there is no clear 
message and clear opinion from the European Union level, from the European Union's level, because. Um, as Ms. Bregu said, there is initiative called the uh, Common Regional Market, and I think that this, this um, uh, new launch, launching of the Berlin process is just to put aside the open Balkans, because the, there is no... Uh, the, the, uh, the European Union is not brave enough to say, to say that the open Balkans is not good for the European perspective of the Western Balkans. And for the Western Balkans, it's quite obvious that th this is not tra transparent initiative. That's an uh, uh, initiative which has just three member states, just three states from the Western Balkans. It does not have contract with it, which is... Uh, which guarantees the same rights for the, and same position for, for the, all the Western Balkan countries. It's the initiative which is kind of replacement for the uh, European Union membership, in my opinion. It's not easy to criticize the regional initiatives, but when you see that something is initiated from the, uh, from the Western Balkans, and is, it was initiated at the time when the when France blocked the opening of accession negotiations with Albania and North Macedonia, it was clear sign that the Western Balkans is looking for the alternatives. So that's something which is not for, uh, good for the Western Balkans, and it's not good to have just three of them in the uh, initiative when you have the almost same initiative under, under the umbrella of the Berlin process, and which is... Um, applied and which is controlled by the European Union. So uh, even I'm also, I can also criticize the common regional market because of the dynamics of its establishment. I'm clearly with the Berlin process and with a regional initiative under the umbrella of the European Union. Um, as Ms. Marovic mentioned, Open Balkan, uh, for those who don't know, is supported by North Macedonia, Albania and Serbia, but strongly opposed by Kosovo and Bosnia. Ms. Bregu, how do you see uh, Open Balkan initiative? Could this be a solution? I don't have a role, so RCC doesn't have a role in the Open Balkans. So mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't really like, like go and make and make uh, comments. I know that we are fully dedicated to give to the region the ultimate goal to have one market, one common market for all. Yes, the initiative of the Open Balkans was proposed by three leaders of the region, and the common regional market is proposed by the same three leaders plus the other three. So uh, it's not that we invented the common regional market. This is the idea that the six of the Western Balkans agreed, they came together, but what Jovanna said is very interesting. And this like, be, makes me, again, like go back to say that how does the region and the chain reaction works? You have a dispute or problems in one of the countries of the region or dispute among two, those spill over the regional cooperation. The agendas of the common regional market and the Berlin process was delayed for like two years and most of the agendas, like the ones that were signed now, didn't see like the light of endorsement because of the disputes between uh, in the dialogue and then non, non, uh, moving ahead in the dialogue between Kosovo and Serbia. Uh, on the other hand, if you have problems and disputes among two economies in the region or two countries, then this makes the process of regional cooperation weaker, the good neighborhood relations not so strong, and again, we don't send that message to the European Union, as Mira was saying, that yes, we are doing things by ourselves, so this as well, being part and one of the conditions to join the EU, should be taken as a plus. So uh, we see how things like start to, to have like uh, uh, retaliate whenever there is like not a good momentum in, uh, in the region. Uh, but again, as, uh, as I said at the beginning, there are enough reasons, and we know that, that we are not uh, a perfect region. Uh, but we have as well like to acknowledge that uh, uh, there are efforts to make this region a good one. And we should not like neglect that. Although I have to say that it's like quite hard and it is quite difficult. Uh, on the other hand, that's why like we keep not only not only like like talking, walking, but trying to find modalities to push the region forward. And it's not like criticizing the EU or uh, uh, USA or the transatlantic partnership in the region. 
But again, this should be a stronger wake up call for them. Whenever, because now it's even a matter of security. And in times when security is challenged as well, that, is, that becomes even more problematic. And especially when we refer to the Western Balkans, when we know still ha we still have ethnic divisions, we still have uh, problems with, uh, with religion, we still have uh, problems with, uh, with the leadership, we still have problems with the freedom of, uh, of vote and elections, we have problems with the media not being trusted, and then we know we have problems with the political parties, we have problems with the corruption that tend to be like considered and look bigger because uh, of uh, whenever this, this uh, EU monitoring mechanism becomes weaker. And I agree with, with the deputy minister. The EU has all the mechanisms in place. Even before the new methodology, the EU had the conditionality mechanism in place. That's why the first chapters to be opened were those of the rule of law in the Western Balkans and security. You have problems? you can just, just stop it. But you cannot leave like a whole period in between in the vacuum because politics we know hates the vacuum. And that makes the region even weaker. We need to be closer. And whenever there is a standard implemented, then we need to move, move ahead. And one more sentence, even when it comes to the, to the funds. We know that funds or like easily and simply said money is never enough. It's not going to be enough now in times of crisis for any of the countries in the world. It's gonna be a global problem to face the upsurge of prices, the energy prices, the food security, and so on. But the Western Balkans needs as well to, you, to have a new policy in place. Those funds needed for the development of the region, be it infrastructure, connectivity, and so on, are better off to be present now and we should be part of all the EU mechanisms, as it happened now with like the energy crisis. If we are part out of the solidarity mechanisms that the EU is offering and is building within itself, it's gonna be harder. If we are like part of that, then even though that is not, never gonna be enough, like the funds given, at least is keeping the Balkans within the same loop. You were just uh, attending the Western Balkan Summit in Tirana, Ms. Bregu. I want to ask you here briefly, was there a feeling that this is a wake-up call in the region? Having in mind it was taking place for the first time in the region and in a time where we have a massive security issues in the north of Kosovo. Did the region show any unity this time, at least when it comes to that matter? I think it was a good message that for the first time the uh, EU decided to keep, to hold like to, uh, the summit uh, EU and Balkans in the Balkans starting from, uh, from Albania. Uh, it might be like starting then it can, can, can move from a specter from, from being a symbolic and then building a, a tradition. Uh, but I think that that, that is like, like quite, quite good news that now things and the discussion on the Western Balkans or the discussion between the decision makers in EU and the decision shapers in here should happen whenever there is a possibility in the Western Balkans. Then it's like, uh, it's a good message as I said as well, because EU is giving the messages within and into the Balkans. So like, like no need and no, no, no necessity and, and less chances for to be lost in, uh, in translation. And again, to see like the whole conflict and the war in Ukraine affecting all of us under a global and EU perspective. Plus mentioning the necessity of the security that I keep repeating is quite important. Now it's not anymore uh, either EU or NATO. It's both EU, it's NATO as well. Our region has to have more guarantees when it, com guarantees when it comes to the security. Uh, Ambassador Kaimakci. If I can make a few comments uh, on, you know, what my colleagues mentioned. First, Mr. Lajcak uh, mentioned that we don't want problems in the EU. We want solutions. We want contributions. And I am asking, you know, who else can contribute more than Turkey uh, to, the ch to the challenges that we are facing? Actually, even before our accession, uh, we are helping a lot, you know, Europe in terms of economic recovery as one of, you know, as the sixth biggest economy. In terms of energy security, we are, you know, one of the, I mean, main four arteries of uh, energy supply to, to the rest of Europe. Not to mention migration, not to mention security and defense. So actually we want to join the EU, 
not to become a problem, but to solve the problems and to make contributions. Of course, in the case of other Balkan states, we have complicated situations. But our case is also a little bit different, so I just wanted to underline this. Uh, I forgot to answer your question, uh, Nefis Hanum, in terms of Open Balkan Initiative. I think it's a good initiative. If they can deliver anything, this is fine. Uh, and actually, Pr Prime Minister Rama has also invited us to join. And uh, we also attended uh, the, the last meeting in, in Serbia. But what was, I think, what is, what is the way ahead is some sort of flexible integration. And actually, when I heard this uh, you know, word of European political community, I was hopeful that the EU would start some sort of flexible integration, multi-level integration, with those who are willing and capable of going. And I think this is the, the way ahead. But what we had in Prague, 44 states coming together, having some sort of UN type of you know, EU General Assembly, uh, it's good that we discuss security, defense, migration, economic recovery, but no uh, concrete actions. Uh, so I think the way ahead is to create a mechanism, a flexible integration mechanism with the candidate countries. And step by step, you know, if it is economy, let's start with the customs union, for example. We are already, I mean, Turkey is benefiting from the customs union, also the EU side. But let's also involve other candidate countries. I think this will give them a direction. But also it will standardize, you know, this, you, I mean, these countries in terms of commerce, trade, competition, and also the other necessary key. Uh, so I was hoping that we would see, for example, European political community formed around different circles where we have 27 plus, I don't know, three countries talking about internal market, for example, where I would see, for example, 37 states, 27 plus 10 uh, potential and candidate countries acting together in terms of EU's foreign and security policy, but you have to involve the countries in it. So if you expect Turkey to follow the EU sanctions against Russia, you are expecting too much. Why? Because you have excluded Turkey in the last five years in any of the discussions on common security defense policy. Why do you expect Turkey to join these decisions if you do not consult Turkey and if you do not, for example, take the concerns of Montenegro, for example, or Albania? So this is why the involvement is important and this is why we have to handle the abuse of veto right and blight EU membership solidarity, which is at the core of the European integration. It is not only about Turkey, Greece, or you know, the Cyprus issue, but we have seen Northern Macedonia. Why Macedonia had to wait 17 years to start the accession negotiations? Why Albania had been linked to North Macedonia for so many years to start the accession negotiations? Why Montenegro is now, you know, slowed down because of the Serbia problem maybe? You know, this is, uh, this is why we have, uh, you know, I am emphasizing the re-Europeanization of the enlargement process, which is the key, I think, to progress uh, in Europe. Mr. Lajak. Yes, uh, Mr. Kamachi knows that he, when he turns to me, he knocks on an open door, uh, but I, I, I understand. Uh, three points, very briefly. First, uh, on the Open Balkans Initiative. European Union, in principle, supports everything that is born in the region, but when it comes to regional initiatives, we always stress two points has to be inclusive and has to be built on European values. So the Open Balkans Initiative is not inclusive. We set three, three uh, partners in, three partners out, but more than that, uh, we have countries which are internally divided. We have uh, countries like uh, uh, North Macedonia where the government is in favor, but the president is against. We had the same in Albania until recently. As a matter of fact, four out of six are internally divided over this initiative. Only Serbia is all in and only Kosovo is all out. 
So the, it's certainly not inclusive. And second, is it built on European values? I don't know, because the EU is not there. And I have not seen this yet. I hear uh, the leaders or the promoters of the idea speak about trade, uh, free flow of goods. I don't hear s s speaking about the values or the rule of law or, or European standards. So we, that's why we, we, our position is like, let's wait and see. But we would definitely believe that the common regional market, and I agree uh, that its implementation or has been delayed, uh, and that's, uh, that's a pity. That would be the right answer. Second, you mentioned that. We did not discuss it, but I really want to stress uh, one very serious enemy to a European future of the Balkans, which is ethnic nationalism. And we speak about rule of law, we speak about fight against corruption, but we somehow tend to underestimate or over overlook uh, the danger which uh, the ethnic nationalism uh, creates or in the region and unfortunately it's more nationalism now than five years ago uh, we see more why, why do you think it's increasing over the probably years? because of uh, decreasing uh, 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 like uh, ten tangibility of uh, of European future but uh, Montenegro is all about discussions about uh, uh, about uh, nationality ethnicity uh, religion, these are the topics from the 90s, and we know how this ended up. And uh, the, I, I'm, I'm very worried, and I really believe we need to pay more attention to, to this issue. Uh, because when we speak about third actors, this is the, act, this is the third actor, which I, I consider much more serious than uh, any other third actor. And uh, my last point is, I, I want to uh, very much echo what Mr. Kramachi said, you call it flexible integration, I personally call it gradual accession, but we speak about the same. And this is uh, very much present in the corridors of Brussels, I would say. We need to change the methodology, we need to change the approach, because clearly the way it was designed early 2000 does not work. And this, the philosophy is to bring the partners in the room whenever possible, to have them uh, speak about issues, to be part of our discussions, without veto right, without commissioner for the time being, but being part of our discussions about European agenda, because normally we bring the Balkans when we speak about the Balkans. But we want them, we want you to be part of all our discussions, and also with the gradual uh, uh, distribution of European funds, because right now it's very little before you join, and then it's a lot. And, uh, when you join, but it would also be good when uh, the money uh, flows in gradually, and I, I'm sure this would have a very positive impact on the on the pro-European forces in the region. Uh, you mentioned uh, ethnic tensions. Uh, since Russia's attack on Ukraine, I have to go back to that. We have seen two biggest crises since the end of the war, one in Bosnia and Herzegovina, which could ex uh, exacerbate very quickly uh, louder secessionist calls from the entity of Republika Srpska, again, through, uh, supported strongly by uh, Vladimir Putin um, and Russia. As we speak, we have tensions in the north of Kosovo, again, ethnic tensions. Uh, what happens if one of these crises uh, escalates? Even the EU officials, as of recently, warned of massive ethnic conflicts if the disputes are not solved. And if this is not a wake-up call, when is it? And do we need to wait again? The situation not similar, I'm not comparing, but like in Luhansk and Donetsk to happen in Bosnia for the EU to speed up the membership process or NATO. And this is a question for all of you because this is something that every single person who wanted to attend this session asked me, will you discuss the tensions in Kosovo and the situation in Bosnia. And this is something that bothers everyone uh, in international media, people here in Tur to Turkey and uh, across the world. Well, the situation in uh, Kosovo keeps me busy 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And uh, as, uh, yes, as you know, we were, uh, it has been a permanent crisis management, which I'm not happy because my primary mandate is normalization of relations, but you cannot speak about normalization when people are building barricades and when you are afraid that, or you, 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 you hear uh, the, the, uh, shootings. Uh, so we are doing our best to make sure, and so far we have been successful to def diffuse all these crises, uh, and there has been no escalation, and I 
believe and I hope there will be no escalation. Uh, there will be tensions, but we need and we, we are planning to start discussing the normalization, uh, which is a, a higher level of, of the dialogue and we, want, we are now working, I'm personally working very hard on, on preparing ground for this. And when you discuss normalization, then you should, it should limit the space for provocations and escalation. Bosnia-Herzegovina, I, I consider Bosnia-Herzegovina the most serious problem in the Balkans. Uh, still, I don't see Bosnia-Herzegovina as a security threat. And I also do not take uh, uh, Mr. Dodik's words at, at, at their face value when he speaks about, about secession, because he knows that uh, that, would be, that would be the end of, uh, of, his, uh, of his political, I would say, uh, of his political line. Uh, and he will I already be the, told you once this, Lajcak, but the EU never actually sanctioned Dodik. The UK and the US did, and you said it was not a unilateral decision. The same problem as we discussed before, but he was never yeah, sanctioned. It con yeah, continues I, to be the destabilizing factor. I am a man of uh, positive motivation, and I can also ask you, what have we achieved with the sanctions? How much has it impacted the way he sp acts and he speaks? Uh, I, I, I am really in, in favor of keeping the channels of communication open, but using them for a very honest, if needed, brutal and dialogue, and we need to, to sometimes, you know, we, we, we as EU uh, speak in a way that we, even we are not sure what we wanted to say, and that's, that's the problem. But we, this will not happen. This, this, is, this is rhetoric, it's destabilizing the country, but let's hope that, uh, and let's not only hope, but work uh, in that direction that after the new governments uh, are, are formed, we will focus immediately on, on, on the reforms. And, Bosnia Herzegovina is very close to being granted candidate status in December. I mean, it, this month. Do you think it will this happen? <sighs> there is a massive optimism uh, in in Bosnia. It looks like it will. I mean, we. It's a week from now. Uh, okay. You never know. Okay. Uh, you never know. But uh, I really hope. I hope it will. You don't mind my skepticism. It would be smart. Yes, it would be smart. Uh, yes, uh, and the feeling is that it should. But it, it, it takes 27 member states to make this decision on Friday, next week, so we will, we will know very well. But I really hope it will happen, and I hope it will have a positive impact on, on Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, Ms. Marovic, final thoughts. We have a couple of minutes left, but that's always with the Balkans. Uh, there are so many topics that we could cover. Uh, Ms. Marovic. Just a few comments on what uh, has been said. First of all, I think I'm also, of course, supporting gradual accession. That's a um, be better case scenario than what we have at the moment. But that's not fair when it comes to Montenegro, because Montenegro, I've been also following this process from 2004, so almost 20 years, and I was there when the stabilization and accession agreement was negotiated when I was de then in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. We are negotiating for more than 10 years. We are really good in terms of technical criteria when it comes to EU negotiation process, so it's not fair to be in the same basket with the, all other countries. I mean, I am not uh, um, that much... What about uh, Turkey? I mean, uh, <laughs> What okay. about North Macedonia, Albania? <laughs> I mean, I am not... What about Bosnia, the no, biggest no, what I'm security to problem say and What I'm trying to say, what, what is the answer to your question, is that all the, uh, all the decisions from the European Union, they always come too late. And that was the thing with the opening of negotiations with Albania and North Macedonia. That also, but that was also, and will be uh, for sure, with the candidate status for Bosnia and Herzegovina, it's also for the visa liber liberalization for Kosovo, and also what I was trying to, uh, during the last seven months to explain that Montenegro really needs some positive signs from the European Union, and that would help to, to uh, overcoming the political crisis that would maybe be the motivation for the political elites to, to go, you know, and uh, uh, further and to try to focus on the reforms. Yes, the thing is that we are more focused in Montenegro on nationalism and other things which are going, which we are going back uh, with, the, with the rhetorics, with narrative, with, the, uh, with the, all the things. But as you, uh, as you said, we cannot uh, just, you know, use this concrete example and not uh, um, take into account other destabilizing factors in the region, as you said, the sanctions towards Russia from the U.S. and from, to, uh, from the EU came too late. So what was the reaction from the European Union regarding the war in Ukraine wasn't enough, you know. That's, that's my opinion and that's 
what should be the uh, example and what should be the lessons learned from for the Western Balkans. So they has to, they have to react now and at the moment, and also with the sanctions towards the corrupt elites in the West, in the Western Balkans. So we are still waiting for Djukanovic to step back and we are still waiting for all political and corrupt uh, leaders in the Western Balkans to step back. And the EU and the US ha have to help us to fight with those corrupt leaders in the Western Balkans. And also just one more thing about the nationalism in the Western Balkans. I agree with all that Mr. Lajcik said the, about the open Balkans, but the messages from the European Union level are not the same. For example, Commissioner for Neighborhood, he is openly supporting the Open Balkans Initiative. That's the same thing with the President of the European Council. And in that way, they are helping the tensions in the Western Balkans. So it's not just about us, it's also about the messages Mixed from the Mixed messages European from, Union from yes. uh, the EU. Ms. Bregu, your, your final thoughts. I can say that the EU has all that it's needed and all the leverage uh, that it needs to play it rightly in the Western Balkans. It's the biggest trade partner, it's the biggest like contributor when it comes in terms of, uh, of financial aid, and I'm not speaking of loans, but of grants, but even in terms of loans now. Uh, so it has all the leverage it needs to play it rightly in the Western Balkans. I hope that in a week time from now, Bosnia-Herzegovina will get the candidate status and uh, Kosovo will seal at least the decision on the visa liberalization that still will have to happen like next November time, which has been like uh, one of the most shameful decisions during the last years, considering that the citizens of Kosovo couldn't move freely in the European Union. And that was one of the reasons why we invested ourselves so much in the freedom of movement with ID cards in the region. Four countries in the Western Balkans were already traveling with an ID card, but Bosnia-Herzegovina and Kosovo have a visa regime among themselves. And in order to at least tear down the latest wall of visa uh, uh, in, in the region, uh, knowing and being like conscious that this couldn't happen through a recognition or an immediate one, at least in, in the near future from Bosnia-Herzegovina to Kosovo, that's why we had to invest all our efforts into a regional, let's say, initiative that could bring all the countries of the region together in order not to have the visa regime for, for the citizens and businesses in, uh, in the region. And again, uh, I have to say, Western Balkans is like, and Kosovo and Bosnia-Herzegovina might be the tinderbox uh, uh, of problems in there. But whenever the West, like the West, the global West, or the collective West, as you used to call EU and, and USA, or the transatlantic cooperation, is stronger than that really helps, uh, helps the change in the Western Balkans. We've seen that during the Trump administration speci specifically. Uh, Ambassador Kaimakji, I'll give you the final uh, words. Um, <coughs> on the very same questions, of course, you know, Bosnia-Herzegovina should be declared the candidate country as quickly as possible. This is important if it is done for Ukraine and Moldova, you know, under the current conditions, why not for Bosnia-Herzegovina? I think it will strengthen, you know, the unity uh, and territorial integrity of this country. And uh, I think now with the new government being formed in Bosnia-Herzegovina, I think there is a new page maybe that we can uh, write on uh, for a better future for uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina. Uh, when it comes to Pristina Belgrade dialogue, of course, we uh, actually, you know, <clears throat> what I was going to say is already said um, by the EU representative, which means that our policies are, you know, uh, very much online. And also, we are doing our best to contribute to the efforts of the uh, of, of Mr. Lajcak, but also when it comes to some, for example, economic issues, electricity issues, we are also using our good offices to encourage compromise uh, between, you know, <coughs> Kosovo and Serbia and between, you know, uh, the capital uh, and, uh, and Mitrovica. So this is important. I think we sh if we make joint efforts to the same direction, I am sure 
we will have much more stable and uh, much faster prospering uh, Balkans together.